right. Hey, I love this. This is great. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, happy Father's Day to the fathers who are here uh, this morning. Um, if you know me, if you've been coming for a long time, uh, I believe that uh, God's highest call for men uh, is to be spiritual fathers, that uh, you don't even have to have biological children to really attain what I believe is God's highest call for your life, which is spiritual fatherhood. It doesn't take long to look around our world and, uh, and to recognize and see uh, that fatherhood is something that is often uh, broken and leaves something to be desired. Many, many people you'll encounter uh, have, have bad experiences with the fathers. Uh, there's so many stories stories that get told, movies that get made, TV shows. Uh, there's just this almost embedded idea of like failed fathers in our, our culture. And it doesn't just, it's not just American culture, it's kind of through human history. And, and, and like Lisa said, I don't find it a coincidence that God uh, has for himself the title Heavenly Father. And, uh, and really, uh, he, this, this title, this, this role of God as our Heavenly Father, uh, it is redemptive. That is, it can heal us, it can restore us, uh, and it can do deep work in our soul. That, that, that goes beyond our understanding as God reveals his great love to us. So this morning, I just want to commend those uh, good fathers this morning, uh, both biological and spiritual. We're so thankful for you uh, and uh, my, my, my fellow fathers in this room. Uh, I really love, one of my favorite things to do is to add strength to men. I think it's a really important thing. Uh, role of the church is to add strength to men, uh, and uh, and so this morning I want to commend you guys and invite you guys, hey, to continue walking with us in discipleship, continue walking with us as we dive into the Word. And this morning I pray God would add strength to you uh, and uh, to everyone else who's here as well. Um, so like Lisa said, my name is Mike Sandusky. I'm the lead pastor here at Living Hope Church, and I've had kind of a hectic travel schedule. So if you've been coming to Living Hope for, uh, if today's your first time or you've been coming the last few weeks, uh, I've, I've had a lot of travel. We had a team go to Pakistan. I joined that uh, and was in Pakistan for a few weeks uh, through April. And, uh, and then uh, we also, we have a family of churches that we, we, we work with and we build with and we plant with. And uh, I spent some time in in California with five of our California churches, and that was really great and refreshing, but it took up a lot of time. Last week, I was in Kansas City. We've got a church plant that we started there, uh, and uh, my good friend Dylan Neely, who actually is a St. John resident. Uh, he, he, he's from Living Hope Church. Originally actually got saved coming into this church and uh, met Jesus, and now he's a pastor, and he planted a church there. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, I've been traveling quite a bit, but it's so good to be back. I'm glad to be here with you this morning, and, and I'm so glad you guys uh, that we're here together. We get to do one of my favorite things, which is dive into the Word of God together. Um, so that's what we're going to do this morning. Um, we're going to continue. Uh, the last time I preached, I shared on John chapter 4. And, uh, and I want to kind of continue that story. It's a big, robust story. Um, I think I could probably spend like 10 weeks preaching through John chapter 4. Uh, and so I thought I should at least do two uh, sermons on this chapter. And so uh, this morning, um, it, it, we're going we're gonna to kind of look at uh, some more of this story. So if you're unfamiliar, this story, this chapter, it's just, it's such an incredible chapter. I'm going to give you some backstory for it. Uh, if you missed the first sermon, I would encourage you to read John chapter 4. Uh, this story is called Jesus and the Woman at the Well, or Jesus and the Samaritan uh, Woman, Jesus and the Woman of Samaria. Um, but basically, I'm going to summarize this story. Jesus and his disciples um, were out doing lots of ministry. It's very early on, very early on in their ministry, right? Now, one of the cool things about Jesus that bl absolutely blows my mind when you really think about it is he spent very little time doing public ministry, okay? Like, he spent very little time. Public ministry is like basically him going and telling the world, uh, teaching the world what he was going to teach, telling the world who he was. He only did this for three years. He only did this for three years. I mean, you think how powerful this is, right? Like, you didn't even finish high school in three years, right? I mean, maybe one of you nerds did, but you know, Jesus, he did only three years of public ministry. And, and, and here we have it, like the very beginning of it, um, in, in, at the beginning of the book of John, and already at the beginning of chapter four, uh, it tells us that, uh, this is what it says, we don't, I don't have a slide for this, but it says, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, he left Judea and departed for Galilee. So we get introduced to this book of John, 
Uh, and, and at the very beginning, chapter one is this powerful uh, th- like chapter about who Jesus really is. And, and it tells us about this character named John the Baptist, who's a different John than the John who wrote the book of John, right? You have John the disciple, who, who was uh, the beloved disciple. He was very near to Christ, very dear to Christ, uh, in Christ's inner circle, which was uh, uh, John, James, and Peter, uh, and, uh, and uh, one of the early disciples. But then you have this character, John the Baptist, who I, I secretly have lots and lots and lots of affection for. I love John the Baptist. Like, John the Baptist was this crazy guy uh, who actually happened to be Jesus' cousin, right? You, you guys all have a crazy cousin, right, who kind of like lives in the woods, maybe in a trailer, eats bugs sometimes. That was literally John, by the way. That's like I always described in the Bible. Like, he's like, he lived in the woods, he lived in the wilderness, and he ate, he ate locusts and wild honey. So he just was living off the land, and he was preaching a radical message. He was preaching a radical message. And, and, and so the first few chapters of John tell us about this John preaching a radical message, and droves and droves of people were coming to him. I mean, it blows my mind, and my heart desires that I could also preach very radical messages that would steer people to uh, our church, right? And, and here's what's great about John. John wasn't drawing people to himself, right? He's preaching these radical messages. Crowds are coming to him at the beginning of the book of John, and what ultimately he does is, is he says, one is coming after me who is greater than I, right? So this revolutionary, radical preacher comes on the scene, and, and he drops into Jerusalem, and huge crowds gather they come into the wilderness. They leave the cities to go to the weird guy preaching and eating bugs, right? That's how powerful his message was. And I just think, like in our world today, I don't know if you've picked this up, but a lot of churches have kind of gotten on this like business model church and, and this sort of excellency. And, and I don't think that those things are inherently evil. But, but here's the thing is that like oftentimes people are drawn to church because, man, you got a really great like atmosphere. You got a fog machine going while like the worship's happening. You got like, you know, your kids are getting served hors d'oeuvres in the back, uh, you know, you come in and, I mean, even, you know, like, heck, even when you turn in your communication card here and we're like, hey, here's, here's a small gift. But man, like, I just think, what if radical preaching, right? I don't even eat bugs. That would be like, like, if I got ate a bug here, some of you would never come back to our church. If I just, in the middle of the sermon, here's some, here's a locust. I'm, I want to be like John. Some weird pastor somewhere has done that in the history of time. You know it. But the point wasn't that he ate bugs. The thing was, he was like, it's like, it's so interesting to me because he was so strange and yet his message was so radical and powerful. He was calling people to repentance. He was basically saying, hey, God is real. God is coming. His kingdom is about to be revealed and you and him, there's a gap. You need to repent and say, Lord, forgive me and draw near. And then he says, one is coming. One's coming with greater revelation. One is coming who's greater than I. He says, one is coming, I'm not even worthy to kneel down and untie the strap of his sandals. He's saying, I'm not even worthy to bend down and serve this guy by tying and untying his shoes. That's how great the one coming after me is. And this is our intro to the book of John. This crazy wild guy in the wilderness, this radical preacher, and I think, man, like, Lord, I long, oh, heavenly Father, I long for the day when radical preaching of the good news of Christ Lord, draw so many out of the cities and out of the way of this world and into you, Christ. I long for this, Lord. I pray that you would make us a church like this, that it isn't flashiness, it isn't comfort, it isn't meeting a bunch of needs, but Lord, it's the word of God purely preached that draws people here. And Lord, not the word like for the sake of purity, but the word for the sake of your glory and the word for the sake of your purposes and the word for the sake of your kingdom. Oh Lord, that you would light hearts of fire for you. You are what we're all looking for. In everything we make and everything we do and all the things and activities of this world, we're searching for something, a better life, a better way, a higher purpose. And Lord, while these things are searched for in the world, we never find them here. They're found alone in you. And Father, I pray that you would help us preach that message, that your kingdom would be revealed here at Living Hope. God, that hearts would be stirred by truth preached in power and in love. God, and in strength and wisdom, Father, I just pray, God, do that this morning. Speak this this morning. Let us be a church like John the Baptist, unafraid of how our outward appearance might be a little off-putting sometimes, because we're not perfect people. But Father, I pray that you would stir in us this radical message of your kingdom. 
Thank you, Lord. Amen. I'm just so stirred by this. So John had come on the scene. People were coming to him in droves, and they were getting baptized. That's, an, that's a sign of inward transformation. They were being convicted by what he said. Listen, listen, listen. This morning, if, 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 if just even for a moment, you feel conviction in your heart, you feel God saying something in your heart, you feel something waken or stir in your soul, right? My goal will have been accomplished because that's the work of God. That's not something I can produce. That's the work of God in your life. And if you feel that, I would encourage you to respond, right? We respond to God through faith, and real faith manifests itself through change and transformation, right? Action, right? You take action. When you believe in something, you take action. Uh, it, you know, it's not, faith is not merely mental ascent. Faith is life changed in a new direction, right? It's believing something so radically, so powerfully that it, it moves you and motivates you. And so, like John the Baptist, as he preached, it had inward power, and it changed people, and they got baptized, and it drew huge crowds. If God's speaking to you this morning, I'm, there's going to be opportunity. I'll invite you to action. I'll invite you to things you can do, next steps you can take that will unveil to you, unveil to you God's wonderful plan for your life. I, I, like I can, I can hand you steps today, and I can hand you truth today that if you receive and if you take steps on, will change your life forever and will fulfill, fulfill things that you've been seeking after because they lead you to Christ, the one who gives us what we're looking for. But John had been, he had been preaching this message. People had been responding. They'd been finding this, this life they were looking for. They were getting baptized. And John's like, someone's coming that's greater. Someone's coming that's greater. The Pharisees, so like the Pharisees in the Bible, they're these religious characters who, who, who had power and control, and they were working with the Romans. If you don't know, I mean, you probably know who the Romans are, right? Everybody knows who the Romans are. Uh, pretty famous uh, empire, pretty famous civilization in history, one of the most powerful. This is what they're known for. And at the time, the Jewish people, they were, they were, living, they were living in Israel, and they were in, it's a very small country. They didn't have political power. They didn't have social power. They didn't have wealth or money. In fact, they had been routed by the Romans very intensely. The Romans came in and like dominated them, suppressed them, and now we're occupying them. Right? You ever think that? When you read the New Testament, there's always these, there's these Roman centurions all around. Like imagine here in St. Joe, right, we just had like, you know, we had like Chinese military people all the time policing us. That's what it was like in Israel. They were oppressed. They were occupied. They didn't have power. They didn't have political power or social power. They were, uh, they were a, a weak people. And the Pharisees essentially sort of traded, uh, they, they traded allegiance to the Romans for power. All right, so they were sort of the most powerful of the teaching class uh, of the Israelites, of the Jewish people. They were religious teachers. They were really serious. So when John comes to the wilderness, starts preaching this radical message, he, had, he actually even called the Pharisees a brood of vipers. Uh, like he's, like, he's like saying awful things about them, like they're liars and they're, they're deceivers and they're fake. Uh, and, uh, and he just says it really plain and boldly because he's John the Baptist. It really angered the Pharisees. And there was a local ruler named King Herod who had basically stolen his brother's wife. And John was like, that's evil. You shouldn't do this. God will judge you for this. And Herod hated it. You know who really hated it was the, the woman who was his former brother's wife who, uh, who then got married to Herod. Uh, Herodias was her name. She really hated it. Uh, and uh, she actually sets a plot in motion to get John the Baptist arrested and killed. Um, it was actually kind of interesting because Herod, who John is preaching at, is intrigued by John. He's like really intrigued by him. Like this guy's saying, you're in sin, you're doing evil, but his message is so full of the Spirit, Herod's like, like intrigued by John, but Herodias hates him, so she ends up working on getting him beheaded. So John was really disruptive. Right? You can think, imagine like somebody comes up and for six months to a year is just disrupting the whole region, disrupting the government, disrupting the legal structure, causing problems for the Romans. Even the Romans knew who John the Baptist was, right? And then someone comes along, and you begin to hear whispers. John said, someone greater's coming. John said, someone greater's coming. And then you hear about a wedding at Cana where the water gets turned into wine. And you begin to hear stories of healings. And you begin to hear stories of power. And you begin to hear stories of following. And you begin to hear stories of John the Baptist's followers going and following this new guy. And John saying, it's him, the Lamb of God. And that's, what's that, that's how John 4 is introduced to us. Sorry, that was all my introduction to John chapter 4. It, the Pharisees heard about Jesus and were like, what? 
And so Jesus goes on the move. And actually, this kind of kicks off the beginning of his public ministry. And what's crazy about John chapter 4 is the first place he goes, he doesn't go to the biggest synagogue. He doesn't go to, like, the place where, where everybody gathers to speak. He doesn't end up at, there's this place called the Areopagus. It was Mars Hill. And all the philosophers and teachers would go to this place, and, and they would speak from the hill and tell their ideas. And huge crowds of thinkers and, and philosophers would gather. That's not where Jesus went first. He first went to Samaria, right, which is a place no one goes. They were a detested people. They were enemies of the Jewish people. They were looked down upon. They were essentially considered a Jewish cult, and Jesus goes there, and he shows up at noon. He's tired. They've been, they're basically running from the cops. You can imagine that's what it's like. Jesus, right? Like, I love this about Jesus. He's always running from the cops, and so like, like not that you should always run from the cops. I don't think, well, what would Jesus do? He'd run from the cops. That's what he, see those signs? What would Jesus, he'd run from the cops, baby. Uh, please, my pastor told me I can run from the cops. Uh, Lord, forgive me. Uh, but the, the point I'm trying to get at is, listen, sometimes, sometimes when you're doing kingdom of God work, it will upset the authorities. There's something inherently rebellious about who Jesus is. There was something inherently rebellious about all the prophets in the Old Testament. Something inherently rebellious about John the Baptist preaching and eating locusts and wild honey, right? Like, there's something rebellious. And so they're, they're essentially fleeing from persecution. The Pharisees are trying to come after Jesus. They're trying to stop Jesus because they're worried, they're afraid, because they hear he's, he's, he's calling disciples. They're getting drawn to him. That's what it says, literally. It's like the Pharisees heard bad, uh, people are coming to him. People who were with John the Baptist are now going to Jesus. We're worried, what's this guy about? And what does Jesus do? He goes, uh, I, you know, I, we don't have it on the front, uh, at the top, but I'm going I'm to read it. Forgive me for this. Michael, I should have given you, I almost gave you the whole of chapter four. I almost did. Our media team, greatly run by Joe, Joe Greider. Everybody give Joe Greider a shout out up there, running our words. Hey, thanks, Joe. All right, I'm going to read this, uh, and, and just to give you the intro. So, he left Judea and departed for Galilee because he heard the Pharisees were coming after him. They were looking for him. And he had to pass through Samaria. He actually didn't. Typically, Jewish people went around Samaria. It would take longer to go around Samaria. But, but Jesus doesn't avoid <coughs> people. He doesn't avoid dark places. He doesn't avoid his enemies. He goes right for them, right? He goes right for them. And, and so it, he, it says he had to pass through Samaria. And he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. This is a historic location in the Old Testament. Uh, so stuff from the Old Testament happened in this land of Samaria, and the Samaritans had kind of claimed to that land, right? Uh, and the Jews hated it. They didn't like that. They didn't like the Samaritans. They would avoid the Samaritans. So he goes through to this, this marginalized people, this, like, you got to think the Jews themselves are marginalized. They're oppressed. They're under the thumb of the Romans. They're under the thumb of the Pharisees, right? And the Samaritans have it even worse, right? They're like rejected by the rejects, right? Like that's who they are. And Jesus is like, I'm going to go. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to find these people. And so Jesus shows up and it's, it says it was about the sixth hour. It says, it says, so Jesus is verse six, uh, wearied as he was from his journey. He's tired. He's worn out. Fully God, but fully man, right? Weariness, like, like we experience. This is God in the flesh. It's, that verse alone could, like I said, I could do 10 weeks on John 4. But, you know, Jesus is wearied from his journey. So he sits by a well, right? He's going to sit down. He's going to rest. What do you get? Well, it's hot. It's the sixth hour. That's noon, right? Noon in the desert. It's a hot time. Sits by the well. Doesn't have anything to draw water from, but he's sitting there resting. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, right? So she shows up. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The disciples, it says, had left and went to go get food. And verse 9 said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? All right, and so Jesus is here. He's tired. He's sitting down. And this woman of Samaria comes up, and, and, and he's, he's weary. He's thirsty. And he asks her for a drink. This is radical. This is powerful. All right, like, so th the, the story gets even crazier. Like, it turns out she's like, if the, if the Jews are rejected and, and, and oppressed, the Samaritans are rejected and oppressed by those who are rejected and oppressed, and the Samaritan woman is rejected and oppressed by the Samaritans, right? They don't want her. She's this woman of controversy, this woman of promiscuity. She's been married to all these men. Her life is a mess, and so she shows up at noon. No one goes to the well at noon. They go in the morning, and they go in the evening when it's cool at both dawn and sunset, and she's showing up, and guess who sees her. It's Jesus. 
He shows up there, and he has this powerful encounter with this woman who, who is rejected and oppressed by those who are rejected and oppressed. She's, on the, she's like on the fringe of the fringe, overlooked of overlooked, and Jesus sees her and speaks to her, and he, she is the first person in the book of John who Jesus reveals that he is the Messiah to. It's the first person in the book of John who Jesus gives, like, he gives the most clear theological teaching uh, in, in this part of, of uh, like, some of the most clear theological teaching he's ever given in, in all of the Gospels to this singular one. And I just, I love it. What does that say about Jesus? Right? It's this powerful encounter. And it speaks to the heart. And this is why the Pharisees were afraid, because this is who Jesus was. This is the kind of work Jesus was going to do. And he, he goes on. I'm not going to read the whole story because I preached on it a few weeks ago, and I don't want to rehash that. But, but it, it ends up being this really, really powerful story. And it's the first place Jesus goes. And he says to this woman, he prophesies over her. He, he, she's actually rejecting him and pushing him away at first. She's like, how do you, a Jew, talk to me? And what are you doing asking me for water? What are you doing asking me for water? I'm a woman. And first of all, I don't, like, Jews couldn't drink, they, he couldn't share a cup with her. If she had a cup that she drank from, according to Jewish custom, he would be ceremonially unclean if he drank from the cup of a Samaritan woman. He could not do that. And yet, Jesus is like looking past that, all right? There's this idea of the Bible. It's not that Jesus would become unclean. It's that Jesus is so holy, Jesus is so pure, that he, he, he transcends the cleanliness rules, right? He could touch lepers, and instead of him becoming unclean, they became clean. That's who Jesus is, right? You know, you ever have a friend? You ever have a friend who says, man, I can't go to church. I go to church, I would light on fire. No, 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 my friend. You don't understand Jesus. You understand that there's wrath that God has and that you rightly deserve it. The Bible says this. We rightly deserve the wrath of God. But God became a human and came, and we were broken, and he took that brokenness upon him. And just like he touches that which is unclean, like a leper, and the leper becomes clean. The, le the uncleanliness doesn't touch Jesus. Your sin, right, it could not stick to Jesus. He took it, he absorbed it, and his holiness, his righteousness has come upon you. If you're here and you don't know the gospel of Jesus Christ, let me tell you what it is right here and now. This is God in the flesh who came down from heaven and sees you wherever you're at, you may feel overlooked. In fact, here's the thing. It's actually harder if you're not like this Samaritan woman. It's harder if you're really confident. It's harder if you really think, man, I got my life together. It's harder if you're really like, I don't need anybody's help. He's a savior. It takes humility to come to a savior. But if you soften your heart and you recognize, actually, I think oftentimes, I tell people this, my friends who say, man, I'm not holy enough. If I came to your church, I'd light on fire. I say, you're not far off from the truth, but I got good news for you, right? At first that terrifies them. It's like, what? <laughs> I didn't think that actually happened. <laughs> it's like, actually it did. But that fire that you feel you deserve landed on Jesus because he loves you, man. In fact, he's made a way. The Bible says you can have confidence to draw near to the throne of grace because of the work of Christ, because of the suffering servant. Like, I mean, this is incomprehensible. And I know you've heard it a lot. Listen, I know you've heard it, like many of you, maybe not all of you. Jesus would often say, those who have ears, let them hear. It's possible you heard something a lot without actually hearing what it is. The God who made the universe, the uncreated, everlasting, eternal God who made all things and is in himself perfect, who we can feel, we can feel the sense of like, I'm not good enough. That God took your I'm not good enough and he put it to death. He took your brokenness and he wore it himself. He took your sin and he wore it himself. He took the sins committed against you so that you can be healed. And he put those to death on the cross. What Christians believe ultimately is that we are broken and sinful, that we were dead, but God, because of his great mercy, he took our death and has made us alive. Not because we deserved it, but because he is merciful and good and wonderful. And this truth, this truth, this truth is transformational. This is it, like we sang it in the song. You know, it's like, man, this truth transforms you from the inside out when you believe it and you receive it. This is what Jesus was doing. This is what he does with the woman at the well. So he gets to the end of this and she's arguing with him and she's mad at him and she's like, how could you ask me for water? And then he's like, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for a drink and I'd give you living water. And he's like, anyone who drinks of the water I give will never thirst again. That's what he says. 
This is what Jesus is saying to you. If you come and drink of his water, if you come and receive what he has, you, he, what he has, right, it satisfies forever. The more you drink of Christ, listen, the sweeter and more satisfying it becomes. The more you drink of Christ, the more you have. It's like if I gave you a treasure that as you dug in, it was like, the, it was like a Mary Poppins treasure chest. Like you're like, there's more here. And the deeper you get, the richer it is, the better the treasure. It's like a, a cup of water that the more you drink, the bigger the cup gets. The more you drink, the more satisfying what you're drinking is. That's who Jesus is. And he tells this woman, this is what I got for you, living water. And she says, you have nothing to draw this water with. And they're sitting by this well and, 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 he, and he's talking about water and she's thinking in the physical, he's talking in the spiritual. Listen, beloved brother and sister, you maybe have heard you have maybe heard the words of God and thought physical and not realized it's spiritual, it's deep, it's invisible. Right, so much about our world, so much about has, what has value and is, has worth is, is not visible to our, the naked eye. It's not all physical truth, it's not all science. Right? There's transcendent truth, spiritual truth. Right? You have a soul, I've never seen it, but I believe it and I know it and I've encountered it. I've seen, I've looked into the eyes of people who have broken hearts, right? I don't see a broken heart, but I see a broken soul. And Jesus is coming and he's talking about the spiritual truth. And he goes on, he says, hey, he says, those who worship me must worship in spirit and in truth. He's saying the truth that he brings is, is spiritual in this way that can sometimes be hard for us. We can, very think, we can think about the physical, right? You, so you may even come to Jesus. You may come to Christ today. You may say, man, what that, that guy's talking about, that Jesus he's talking about, that salvation he's talking about, I want that. And you may receive it, and you may feel, here's the thing, when you receive it, the Bible says you'll be born again. You will, you will experience something unlike anything else you've ever experienced. Your, your, your soul being reborn, you, who you are in the deepest parts of you are being born again. But here's the thing, your life, your outside life, actually might have a lot of trials and suffering that hit you early, right? And you may say, well, I gave my life to Jesus. Why all of a sudden are things so hard? Right? Because this isn't primarily about the physical, it's primarily about the spiritual. You're born again from the inside out. You're born again from the inside out. And actually, I do believe this. The Bible tells us that, that actually as we endure those physical difficulties and circumstantial problems in our lives, you know, things going hard or things, things not going the way we want them to go in, our, in the circumstances of our life, actually God says when you cling to him through that, he will, he will do more work in your life, better work in your life. He'll actually use those things to forge you into the person you were meant to be. Turns out, if you read the Bible, what it says is difficulty, conflict, and hardship is part of God's plan into making you glorious. You want to be glorious, you can't avoid all conflict. You persevere through it well. A right? person who's glorious isn't the person who has all the answers to all the conflict. It's the person who can cling to Christ while he forges your heart and soul into Christ-likeness. That's, that's a life that's glorious. So he tells this woman, and I, and I love this story because finally at the end, you know, he's like, go get your wife, or go, go get your wife, go get your husband and come back to me. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right in saying that you don't have a husband. So, uh, he says, the man you're now with is not your husband. You've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you've told me is true. And she looks at him, and she says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. I love this. And then they get into this long spiritual conversation. She's like, they debate, and then she's like, well, I know when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us everything. And then she, he, sa he looks at her. I love this. This is like Jesus doesn't do this often in the Gospels. It's like when you realize that you may be a longtime Christian, and you never realize like how radical the story of the woman at the well is, right? Like that, that like she's a Samaritan. She's like a shameful, promiscuous woman in the culture and in the day. He, you shouldn't even have talked. He shouldn't, one, he shouldn't have talked to a Samaritan. Two, he shouldn't have talked to a woman in the middle of the day, one-on-one. -on -one. Like Jesus would bust through social barriers to demonstrate the love of God, right? Sometimes we got to do this. And sometimes the cops will chase you for that, right? Right? <laughs> Look at early civil rights movement, right? Like what God, like people pushing through social barriers, breaking down racial walls in the name and love of Christ. Listen to Martin Luther King Jr. That man knew the love and grace of mercy of Jesus Christ and would push through barriers. And guess what? The cops came, right? But if you're speeding down the highway 102 miles an hour, you can be like, my pastor said I can run, baby. Uh, those are different things. Those are different things. Wildly different things. Here Jesus is doing it the right way. He's pushing through these barriers. He's talking to this woman. And then she looks at him and she says, I know the Messiah is coming and when he comes, he'll tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. 
It's rare he plainly reveals himself like this in very simple words. What love, what love. I'm telling you what, God wants you to know. Jesus wants you to know. Messiah means savior. It it, it means redeemer. Uh, What God wants you to know is that he is looking at you and he is the redeemer of your life. He's not just some, you know, obscure generic redeemer. He's the redeemer for all that you're looking for. He's the savior that you have been searching for. He, He tells us he has this famous line. You've probably heard it. If you haven't, it's a good one. I'd love to hear this for the first time. Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. Right, the great secret of Christianity isn't that Jesus is like, like, a, like a pinata that you, once you discover, you start smacking him with a stick and candy falls out. No, 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 he's saying he is the treasure. He is the living water. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life you've been looking for. Colossians says your life is hidden with Christ who is in heaven. He is the life you're looking for. He is the way. He is your peace. He is your great joy. And this shouldn't mystify you, right? That, that, that somehow this other person, this being, this relationship with God, the spiritual fatherhood with God the Father, the spiritual brotherhood with Christ, that this is the thing you're looking for. I mean, every single human being on the planet is looking for salvation in a relationship. How do you know this? 98% of our songs are about relationship, right? Like, it, it, our, song, our hearts sing songs searching for love, the perfect relationship. And so every song is written, and it's either about love going really well, love not being received, or love that's just broken. We've been talking with the interns, and I've been trying to convey to them. We got 10 summer interns. Praise the Lord for that. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, it's great. And, and I told them, I said, think about this. Like, you get, like God... God is relational. That's why you choose the name Father. So I, I one time had this, I almost used a really inappropriate church word. But I can't even tell you what I was going to say. Unkind person. Um, I met this unkind Christian, and they said, and this was, I was, I was like teaching and leading, and they said to me, they go, you know what, the Bible never, God never says he wants a relationship with you. Why do you tell people that? And he's a Christian. He's like, God never says he wants a relationship with you. He never said, like, it's not all about a relationship. And I just looked this person in the eye and I said, I said, dude, God's a father. What is a father if not the most important relationship anyone could have in their lives? Or at least one of two of the most important relationships. You get it by default. You don't even get to choose. You have to have a father. You have to have a mother. And he just looked at me like, oh, (laughs) I never thought of it. It's like, it's in his name. It's in his nature. He's a father with a son. We've been invited in. We've been invited into this wonderful dance. God is calling people to himself. He's inviting us in. So this woman gets invited in. He's the Messiah. He's what we're looking for. He's what she's looking for. Verse 28, the disciples had come back. They were silent. They were a little bit shocked. It says they they marveled that he was talking with a woman. Verse 28, so the woman left her water jar She was so consumed with water, here she is, she left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and they were coming to him. All right, so this woman who's a social pariah, who's a reject of reject, Jesus turns into his first evangelist. I love this. I mean, I guess John the Baptist is kind of the first, all right? called by God to sin, to say, hey, here's Jesus, here's the Messiah. And that, it's not just John the Baptist in the wilderness, but it's the woman of Samaria, the woman at the well, who she goes and she says, come and see one who told me all I ever did. All I ever did. And it says the town went out and we're coming to him. The message has the power. It's not about, like this woman wasn't trained. She wasn't like, oh, I'm ready to go be an evangelist. Oh, you know what, I, I happen to go to preaching school. No, 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 no. This woman was not trained. This woman was called. This woman was given a message. And I want you to know something. You have been called. If you are in Christ, it's not just salvation. It is salvation. And man, is that infinitely glorious. It's also a call and an invitation to build a kingdom and convey a message that isn't an obligation, but is a joy. It's the way and the truth and the life of Christ revealed. And it's a great joy to get to participate with Jesus. So his disciples come up and they're mystified by this. 
they're mystified by this. And you might be mystified by this. And you might look at this story and say, oh, Jesus is the only one who can do this. Oh, or that's Jesus, and I'm not Jesus. And if somebody walked up to me, I wouldn't be able to say, hey, the person that you're now married to isn't your spouse. And you've had five spouses before. And you're like, if I say that, they'll be like, what are you smoking, man? Uh, you've been eating wild, wild honey out in the wilderness? Something weird got in the honey, man. No, you're like, I can't do that. But listen, John the Baptist just went. He had a call, he had a message, and he went. And guess what? People came. Even though he was weird, you might be weird. God's got a call and a message for you. This woman at the well. Man, I lo- isn't this crazy? When you think about this, like all three pictures, the beginning of John, who gets called? Who gets called? Who gets called? Everybody gets called, right? First, it's John the Baptist, weird cousin, eating bugs in the wilderness. God calls him to himself, gives him a call and a message, all right? Next, it's the, it's the everyday people, working class, fishermen who hear, hey, you hear that guy? He's preaching something. He says another one's coming. Could it be the Messiah we're looking for? This world isn't working for us, all right? This world isn't working for us. Like this world wants to set you against other human beings. Jesus wants to invite you into a kingdom that brings life. The world wants to equip you to fight. Jesus wants to invite you into his light. That wasn't supposed to rhyme, but it is what it is. I'm not that kind of pastor, sorry. If you like that guy, I mean, occasionally on accident it'll happen. Sometimes people like, you make something rhyme, they're like, oh, mind blown. (laughs) Come on. Rarely does Jesus rhyme. Uh, Still what he says is the most incredible things I've ever heard. But, you know, anyway, sorry, tangent. Uh, All right, so these commoners, he invites the commoners in. Chapter three, he encounters a Pharisee, a Pharisee who hears the message, sees the signs, and is like, could this be? And he goes. Even a Pharisee comes to Jesus, and we know he believes in Jesus because the day Jesus dies, he shows up to take the body off the cross. If you didn't know this, Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the night, right, looking for him. So, so you got a weirdo in the wilderness. You got commoners who are everyday people. You got a Pharisee who's the elite, who has wealth, who has it all. And then you have this woman on the edges of society. The message is clear. Everyone's invited. Everyone is called. Your past doesn't define who you are. Your victimhood, don't let the world tell you this. Your victimhood The things done to you do not define who you are. Jesus comes to set the captives free. He can heal those wounds. He can break those chains. He can turn you into someone who doesn't walk around lifting up oppression to get authority in this world, but rather he defeats oppression and sets you free that you can go and find others to set free in the name of Christ, not by your strength. It's not about your gift. It's not about, you know, it's about his call and his message. He gave all these people a call and a message. What's he say to the disciples? The disciples got to see it up close and personal. And even the disciples, just so you know, they were called from a variety of places. You got a zealot who's like, you know, probably would have stormed the Capitol. Let's just say it. He would have been, Simon the zealot would have been like in the Capitol storming it. Jesus called him to something better than that. You got a tax collector who's like a thief stealing from his own people. Jesus called him to himself. You got blue class, uh, blue class, blue collar, blue class, that's not right. Blue collar workers, right, fishermen out, and and Jesus calls them to himself. You got people from all walks, Jesus calls them to himself, all right, and and I just, it's incredible. He's calling us to himself. So the disciples, they they get this up close view, and, and it says here, so the woman went, she told everybody, the crowd comes, they respond to the call and the message. It's not about her abilities, but it's about her call and her message. It's not about your abilities, it's about a call and a message. And this was the verse I was going to zoom in on today. We'll we'll wrap up with it today. It says, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Right? Just like the woman was caught up in water, they're caught up in the physical. Rabbi, eat. Rabbi, eat. But he had said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Right? Don't miss it, right? I love this, because the disciples, like, I think sometimes we're like, these are the elite Christians of Christians. They were also kind of dumb sometimes, and I'm kind of dumb sometimes, but right, God still calls me, and God still loves me, and God still uses me. God used these men to do great things, used these people to do great things. These early disciples in, in, in the book of John. So they're focused on bread. Eat, you're tired. We came here to rest. Eat. I have food to eat you do not know about. Did someone give him bread? Jesus said to them, my food 
is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes. He's saying, can't you see when it's time to go gather the fields? Can't you see when the, uh, the, tr- the apples on the tree are ripe. He's saying, look around you. The harvest is ripe. People are ready. Look around you, brothers and sisters. Our world is, is, the death of this world is on display everywhere, and it might be depressing you, and it might be leading you to misery, and it might be leading you to hopelessness, but let me tell you this. Jesus is one who takes hopelessness and gives hope, living hope. Jesus is one who takes brokenness and heals and restores and makes us whole again. Jesus is one who takes us from death and brings us life. So if death is reigning in this world, if you feel hopeless about this world. Let me tell you something. I know the one who is the way and the truth and the life, and it's not just passion. It's reality. It's love. It's the kingdom of God revealed in a man who is also God in human form, and he's real, and he's calling you to himself, and he brings life where there's death, and this is the work he's doing. You can participate with him. When we say the kingdom of God is at hand, it doesn't mean we're building towers and saying, oh, we're so righteous and we're so good and the world's so broken. No, 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 no. To bring the kingdom is to go to the hard places. To bring the kingdom is to see the woman at the well. To, see, to bring the kingdom is to go to the rich and the poor, the black and the white, every person, every people, and say, God loves you, God sees you, he's covered your sin, and he's calling you to come be a part and to come build with him. And he's building a kingdom that sets captive free and brings life where there's death. And what better work, what better purpose, what better call could you have? Jesus says, it's so satisfying, it's like food. To do the work of God, It's not an obligation. You're not earning your salvation. It's freely been given. It's freely been given, brothers and sisters. This is why it's satisfying to do. He says, the work of God is like food that satisfies. He's hungry, he's thirsty, he's tired. The work, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. He says, lift up your eyes. The fields are white for harvest. Verse 36, already the one who weeps, reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying tr- holds true. One sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap uh, for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into that labor. Listen, here's what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. He's inviting the disciples. He's like, they're mystified. But here come all these Samaritans from, the, from Samaria. And the disciples got to be, what kind of conversation? Like, how do you even, what? Right, it doesn't compute. You, there's a woman here, and now the whole city's coming? A shameful woman at that? A woman you shouldn't have been talking to? And now all Samaria is coming to you, Jesus, to ask, to talk? And they're like, is this the Messiah? And the disciples had to be like, you told them you're the Messiah? <laughs> you haven't even, right? Like, hasn't even been clearly revealed to them yet. It's like, you told her before you told us? It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And Jesus says, hey, listen, listen. The work of God, the life of God, walking in the call of God, proclaiming the message of God is so satisfying. It's like food. And then he goes on, he talks about sowing and reaping. He says there's fruit. Listen, imagine somebody just gave you a field of fruit trees. Right? Already the work has been done. They give it to you for free. And all you got to do is go and pick the fruit. And imagine it's fruit trees that, like the fruit never goes rotten. The fruit never falls off on its own, but it's just always viable. It's always got fruit. You can always go in and and grab and eat and be refreshed and and be satisfied. And and you can go gather fruit and you can go, you can go sell that fruit and you can, you can, you can like, you know, you can, you know, harvest wages from this, he says. And what this means is, you know, he's not talking about physical money, right? I think he's talking about something much more valuable, like purpose and joy and life. You can go pick these apples and bring them into discipleship and bring them into the kingdom. I mean, the number of people, listen, people in this room, I heard a story this morning of redemption, relational redemption, that my heart has been singing about for months. My heart has been singing about for months. In this room, there's people. I heard a story this week. I got a friend. Listen, I, two days ago, I was worried my friend was going to die. Someone I love dearly. Someone I, I, I know dearly. And, and she's just had, like, some of the worst health issues you could imagine, right? And yet the joy of Christ sings from this woman. She has suffered. I don't know if I know a person who has suffered more than her. And yet the joy of Christ sings from her soul. And I say to her, I said, her name's Daniela Harrington. She's a wonderful woman of God. 
her and her husband David Harrington, they're part of our, our church in, in St. Louis, and just incredible. And, and one time I was telling Danielle, I was, I was talking to her, and I said, Danielle, I said, I don't even know what it's like. I've never suffered like you. And she said, I'm going to stop you. She goes, listen, like just because I've suffered doesn't mean your suffering is invalid or you don't know what it's like to suffer. And I thought, how refreshing in a world to like today, right? Where like basically we have this like suffering Olympics happening in our culture where it's like, where like people are vying to see who suffered the most. And yet this woman with this sweet and quiet soul, and she is not a quiet person. I want you to like, like she's a strong, bold woman of God. Anybody who knows Daniela will tell you this. And, and, and this woman has suffered so incredibly well and she's such a spiritual giant to me. And, and, and yet, in regards to her suffering, it sings of the glory of Christ and the refreshment of Jesus. And I'm just so strengthened by this. She had, she had a, a diagnosis. The story is, was being shared publicly this week on Facebook. And like, it, like basically she had bacteria growing in her heart. This is bad, really bad. And due to her, you know, and, and, and like, and I'm like praying and I'm like, man, I, I was a microbiologist before I was a pastor. And so like, I'm like, this sounds awful. This is terrible. And so like, and, and we pray for her a lot. She's in the hospital a lot. She's, I mean, again, I don't know any human being who suffered like she does and like she has. And yet the, the glory of Christ sings from her life. What a testimony. And so like, we've prayed for her before, but I was like, this is so serious. This is maybe the most serious it's been. And I'm like, Lord, like, you know, I'm like contemplating, like, is my friend going to die? Are we going to lose, you know, and I'm thinking about this. And, and, um, and yesterday, you know, my wife was like, hey, she's like, did you hear? And she reads the story. I don't, I don't have it pulled up, but, you know, uh, maybe McKinsey, maybe you pull that story up. You could read it while we're worshiping today. Uh, my wife, she can pull that up. But basically, they, they said they're, 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 they had seen, it was very visible, like bacteria growing. It's very visible. So there were like these growths, these, these things in her heart that were in there. And we all start praying. And yesterday, they said the doctors went in and they did the imaging and they can't find them. And they don't know where it is. And the doctors are completely mystified. <laughs> and they're like, they don't understand. And I'm just like, man, this is, inc-. I'm like, what? Like, I, my mind is blown. Every time a crazy healing like this happens, my mind is blown. But like, this is who Jesus is. He's a miracle worker. This is the kind of work he's doing that is so satisfying. I think it's so life-giving to get to tell her story, my friend's story, right? Like I get to just, because I know her, I get to tell her story. That's, I'm getting to pull apple off a tree I did not plant. I get to share it with you guys. And like, you know, anyway, it's incredible. Here's the, here's the big idea here. It's Jesus is inviting you. He has got a call. He has got a message for you. First of all, he's got a life. If you don't know him as the way, the truth, and the life, that's what he's calling you to. But he's got purpose for you that is so satisfying. It's more satisfying than anything in this world that you could find. And listen, you're like, how do I do this? Well, first and foremost, the first step is you say, Lord, I'm gonna, I'm gonna seek after you. Like I said earlier, if you, I hope and I pray, and I, I, I can't make it happen, but I hope and I pray the word of God was so clearly preached, the truth was so clearly preached today that you felt this lightness, this light, this switch, this power inside of your heart. Maybe in your mind you're like, oh man, it just seems so clear. Here's the thing, this is not some superpower that I have. This is just the message of Christ preached has power, right? You see it through the hall of John. John preaches the message of Christ has power. The woman goes with the message of Christ, it has power. And that message is available to you. If you seek him, you will find him. When you seek him for all, with all your heart, the word of God says. So just like you've come here and you've cut out time to come ch- to church today, and I pray, maybe for some of you, like this is an inconvenience, I just gotta check it off, or you know, it's Father's Day, so my dad wants me to come, or I'm just showing up for my friends, or whatever it might be. I hope and I pray that God spoke to you here. And, I, and, and the thing is, is that God is always available to you. Like, I, you know, these, 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 these things I'm sharing with you, I just go, you go to the word and you drink of the word. And it's like living water. The more I drink of this, the more I see. The more I drink of this, the more satisfying it is. Sometimes the first sip of the Bible can be a little bit challenging. Sometimes like, you're not meant to do it on your own. You're meant to be built up in a community. But I just, here's what God's, he's calling you to himself. More to himself. Right, Parker's message last week, incredible. If you missed it, I'd encourage you to listen to it. But ultimately, this is the step. And it's, it's actually so simple to walk in the kingdom because every step is the same. The band can come up. But it's, God's calling you to himself. And he's, he's calling you to seek him. And this is how this can look. This morning, you can come and receive prayer. I would invite you. It's gonna be a bold step, but faith takes bold steps sometimes. If you feel God stirring your heart about anything this morning, come forward. We're gonna have prayer teams up here. And just say, hey, I don't know what God's stirring in my life, or I feel like God's stirring this in my life. Whatever you feel like God's stirring, 
step forward and say, can you just pray for me? And God can speak. He can speak like he did the woman of Samaria. You may get a prophetic word this morning. God, in fact, I, it's, it's highly likely that God would say something through someone praying for you because his spirit empowers us. His spirit sees all and knows all. And, 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 and so I would just encourage you, if you feel that, come forward. And, and I would just say, listen, come to the Lord. And, and if, you're, if you're not someone who regularly attends and comes to this, like church isn't just about an obligation. It's about coming to be a part of a people. It's about coming to be a part of a kingdom that's being built, right? And we're doing real things. We want to see, like, we want to see all these people Jesus reached in the New Testament. We want to see them reached in our city. We want to go to the places people aren't going. We want to go to the places where there's marginalized, re rejected people, right? We go to the jail. We go to the food kitchen. We minister to the homeless population. We, we do a lot of ministry to immigrant populations, and it has been so eye-opening, right? The government does a lot for immigrants, but very few people do anything for immigrants that would be relational and friendship and the love of Christ. Guys, the harvest is plentiful. Very few people are ministering to the homeless people. The harvest is plentiful. Very few people love those who are in jail. The harvest is plentiful. Your neighbor, your coworkers, the people around you, they're searching and looking and they're depressed and hopeless because death is reigning in this earth. You can see it when you see politics. You can see it when you see social media. You can see it when you see the venom being spat at one another from other people. Jesus has called us to a better way. The harvest is plentiful. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, I just, I pray this morning you would call us to yourself. Call us to be your people. I pray that you would put a divine call and message in every heart here today. Father, I pray that there's someone here who came, did not come with any expectation, and Father, you lit their heart on fire today for your kingdom and your purpose and your life. And Father, I pray that your real power would come, that you would bear fruit in our lives, that each one of us would feel the power of your spirit, the, the wonder of this message of grace and love that is demonstrated in you, Jesus, and that it would move us and change us, and we would be a people empowered, a people called, a people with a message, and a people who seek after you, Christ, and are just like you everywhere we go. Father, forge this in us draw us together in unity. God, help us as we gather on Sundays, as we gather in community groups. And Lord, I pray you bless every single church in this city, in this nation, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, preaching the man who went to the woman at the well and, and, and redeemed her. Father, I pray you would bless those churches. I pray you'd bear fruit in those churches. I pray, Lord, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven, as the glorious message of Jesus is preached. And let a fire in our hearts that we would say, Lord, to do your work and to walk with you is like eating really good food. It's like walking into a harvest, a field of fruit trees on a pleasant day and just plucking fruit off and enjoying the taste while we walk with you. Heavenly Father, I pray do this work in us. Stir us and call us. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.